So, Toby, for the magazine this week, you write that Labour's policy to add taxes onto private schools would lose the Treasury money, harm social mobility and won't make the education system fairer. Can we start with the first part of that? I mean, how would the Treasury actually lose money by levying this tax? Yeah, well, um, Labour estimates that um, this will raise about 1.7 billion. And it's um, announced, I think, various things it intends to spend this bounty on. But according to an analysis by a financial consultancy company called Baines Cutler, which provides uh, consultancy services to independent schools, um, it would actually lose the Treasury money. And the way they work this out is, first of all, I mean, I think that where... um, uh, Keir Starmer has got the 1.6 billion from uh, the 1.7 billion. Is first of all, 1.6 would just be multiplying what parents are currently paying by way of private school fees by 20%. And then you add the additional amount that private schools will be paying when they're forced to pay full business rates. Um, but the problem is that um, when you make schools, when you make school fees liable for VAT, schools can then claim back some of their Uh, some of the VAT they're playing on supplies, which means they can probably lower their fees a little bit. And according to Baines Cutler, actually the bounty will be more like 15% of what parents are paying now rather than 20%. And in addition, and this is the really critical factor, because that will nevertheless make private school fees unaffordable for vast swathes of parents. People imagine that if you're sending your child to a private school, you're very wealthy, you're a member of the super rich. Not true, often middle-class families making sacrifices, um, one, one partner, giving up all their salary to pay children's school fees. So if they do go up, I mean, it's price sensitive. If they do go up, Baines Cutler estimates that about a quarter of private school students will move into the state sector. So that's reducing the take by another 25%. But critically, if they have to move into the state sector, the state then has to pay to educate them in the state sector. And not only does that mean paying for more teachers, it also means building new classrooms. And Baines Cutler estimate that the total cost to the Treasury will be about 416 million a year over the five year period of the next Labour government. Well, Fiona, do you agree with those calculations? Well, I mean, the first point to make is that there's the government's own figures say that the, the school world is going to drop by a million pounds over the a million pupils over the next decade. So that there is a lot of sca- spare capacity in the system. And to give you one example, I mean, there are eighty thousand school places in London at the moment that aren't filled, and ninety thousand pupils in the private sector. So they could easily be accommodated without any extra cost. And I, I mean, this twenty five percent it seems is a sort of rough estimate. Nobody knows how many parents would come back into the state sector. But for me. It, it, it isn't even a matter, really, of the money. It's a matter of principle. Mm-hmm. There are 8 million children in state schools, including our own, Toby, who are funded at about £5,000 per pupil per year. There are half a million children in private schools funded at approximately £15,000 a year. And that's fundamentally unfair. You cannot have a system where a small minority of children are funded to such an extent that's therefore that's then subsidised by the taxpayer in this way. So I think it's a political argument. We don't believe in subsidising the education of the most well-off in society. We, we believe in redistributing the money, however much it is, to the least well-off, who bloody well need it at the well, moment. I, I think you've got it um, back to front, Fiona. It's not that the taxpayer are subsidising Uh, taxpayers are subsidising private school parents. Uh, It's the other way around. Um, Private school parents are paying twice over for education, once for their own children's education, and the second time for other people's children's education. Um, uh, And, you know, it it, it seems to be looking a gift horse in the mouth to say to these parents who are paying twice over for education and paying for other people's children as well as their own, sorry, you're going to have to pay more for your own children's education. I mean, aren't they paying enough, given that they're paying twice? You You don't say to people, please leave the National Health Service and go privately to save the state money. We want public services that are used by everybody across the community. That's what gives them their status and their validity in society. If they become just a rump service for poorer people, they're done for. So I think we want we want public services to be used by everyone. And I would welcome back all those parents into the state sector. And I'm sure they'll find it's much better than they think it is. And they would enrich all their local state schools, as you've always known, I, ha- I make that case. Well, we can go back and forth about whether it would actually um, cost the taxpayer money or uh, the taxpayer would gain. Uh, but let's, let's just take it for granted that it's costing. But do you, can I ask you a question? Do you accept that it is fair that a small group of pupils in this country are funded to such a 
a, a, a lavish degree, extent compared to the majority of children in the state. Do you think that's fair? One of the points I make in my article, Fiona, is that about five years ago, I was the co-author, uh, along with several people, of a paper that was published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal in which we looked at the GCSE performance of a group of private school pupils and a group of pupils at state schools controlling for all the characteristics they arrived at the schools with. So prior attainment, parental socioeconomic status, the gen genetic markers associated with, with educational achievement. And we found that if you control for all those factors, uh, the GCSE results of children in private schools are really no different to the GCSE results of children in state schools. Toby, does, does the inequality come a bit later down the line then when it comes to universities? Because private school children are disproportionately more likely to get into Oxbridge, for example. Yeah, but you can't just look at that, Cindy. You have to look at whether if you control for all, their, all the characteristics they bring with them, when they arrive at the school, they're still doing better. And children with those same characteristics at state schools are just as likely to get into universities. You can't just look at the percentage of people in private schools who get into universities. You have to look at whether they're actually getting a leg up in virtue of going to private schools. And the evidence suggests they're not. Well, in terms of exam grades, no. But of course, pe pe there's a lot more to private education than just the exam results. And anyway, you're talking about one sliver of state school educated pupils. The ones I'm talking about are the poorest ones who'd never be in the private sector in the first place. You're paying for the, the sports facilities. You're paying for the contacts. You're paying for the, the tutors in the sixth form who help you get into Oxford and Cambridge. You're paying for the drama. You're paying for the enrichment. You're paying for the school trips and things. You know that is just not affordable in the state sector at the moment. That's fundamentally unfair. You could say it's unfair that some people live in bigger houses. Um, but I think uh, let, let's look. You say, Fiona, that you're concerned about the least well-off children and how they're doing in state schools. I say in my article, and I think this is an argument you'd understand, that if you force lots of aspirational middle-class parents to educate their children in the state sector because you make private school fees unaffordable, they're going to find places in the highest performing state schools. And that's going to push out. We know this, you know. Uh, yeah. when, when the, a, the, the poorest when children are not in the highest performing well. state schools. When, when, the, when a school is doing well, a state school, a good comprehensive, middle class parents will move heaven and earth. They'll game the system to get their children in, whether it means going to church and pretending to be pious Christians, buying property in the catchment area of the school. Whatever it takes, they'll do it to get their child into the high performing school. And the children that will suffer as a result of all that migration from the private to the state sector are the disadvantaged children that currently can... But they're, they're not in those schools, Toby. They're, they're not in those schools. schools. You know that perfectly well. Rounds, they're, they're not right. in those schools. They're not in the grammar schools. They're not in the selective church schools. They're in the schools that, you know, don't fiddle their admissions in that way. And incidentally, you know perfectly well that I've always been in favour of admissions reform. So I would make that a big Labour policy alongside this one so that you did make access to the best, best schools more accessible to the poorest children. I'm just interested in how we get invest more money in the education of the poorest children in society at a time when the gap is widening, not narrowing, between the richest and the poorest. And I think it's frankly obscene that the funding differentials between the state and the private schools are so extreme that anything we can do to narrow that is a good thing. And I think that's what this proposal is attempting to do. But Fiona, if the sums don't add up in the way that Toby has set out, what is the point? I don't accept they don't add up because I think there's plenty of capacity in the state system. And I've told you the government's own figures say there are going to be a million extra places in the next decade. There's plenty of capacity in the state system as it is funded at the moment to absorb extra children. In fact, the state system would would very much love to have those extra children because otherwise state schools are going to have to close. Fiona, the, 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 the schools which have spare capacity are the least successful schools, the schools that parents don't want to send their children to. And the middle class children, the refugees from the private sector, you know as well as me, are not going to end up in those schools. It's the children they push out of the better schools that are going to be shunted into those low performing well, schools with spare space. I can give you many space. examples of state schools that have been turned around by the arrival of a group of motivated middle class parents. And I'm, I'm sure you know many them yourself. So I, I don't, ex I, all I'm, I'm not, I, what I'm saying is that the money is there to fund a million pupils at the moment who won't be there in 10 years time so that it's not going to cost the state any more money if 20, you know, if 150,000 children come in from the state sector. And also, as you perfectly well know, these state, these private school places are distributed very unequally across the country. They tend to be in certain cities and there are huge swathes of the country that don't have many children in private education. So in places like London, where there are a lot of extra school places at the moment, it would be perfectly easy to, to accommodate them, even in what are perfectly good schools at the moment. 
Can we, can we talk a little bit more about something that both of you have mentioned, which is how middle class parents game the system? You know, Fiona, you mentioned admissions reform. How would that look like when it comes to the state sector? Because, you know, I went to a grammar school and I saw lots of middle class parents who probably could have afforded private education. Uh, but because my grammar school was so good, they put them into the catchment area and to put them through the 11 plus for that school. And, and as you say, pushed out people who otherwise uh, would have got there. But well, the 11 plus system. is the biggest middle class you know, swindle to get into school because you can pay for coaching for your children from the age of seven or eight Mm. to pass the test. And that's why the grammar schools have very, very few children eligible for free school meals or the pupil premium. So that needs to go for a start. I think the way that church schools, many church schools admit their pupils need to be looked at. And I think that the proximity uh, criteria need to be looked at because that means people can buy houses in those areas. I would certainly reform all that as well. You know, I mean, that would be a more pri- bigger priority for me in a way, but we're not talking about that at the moment. We're talking about charity. But successive yeah. Labour governments have failed to enact those admissions. I'm not, I'm not a member of the Labour Party. I'm not well, arguing for the Labour Party. It's not going to happen. It's politically too difficult. It's too unpopular. Ma- ma- grammar schools are located in marginal constituencies. If you ask the question, so I'm not answering it. using this policy as a kind of elixir, which will cure unfairness in the system. But you know that without admissions reform, it'll just have a negative impact on social mobility, not a positive one. And can I make another point in connection with social mobility, Cindy, which is that at the moment, uh, in order to retain their charitable status, independent schools do an enormous amount of work uh, to try and help uh, uh, less, less advantaged children get a, get a step up. So about 85% of independent schools have partnership arrangements with local state schools. The school that I helped set up in West London, uh, the West London Free School, has an arrangement with Latimer, a next door private school. They let us use some of their facilities. 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 Yeah, crumbs um, from the rich uh, man's table, 40, exactly. Pupils. There are 40,000 pupils in the independent school sector that benefit from scholarships and bursaries. Keir Starmer himself was the beneficiary of a bursary when he went to Rygate Grammar School. All all those children currently getting a leg up, being given a helping hand by the independent sector, it won't stop altogether, but they won't have the same incentive to engage in that partnership work to create those bursary points. So if there's no children. tax benefit to retaining Could their I say something? One percent of children in the private sector are on full bursaries, right? And unless you're on a full bursary, it's going to be quite expensive for you. Some of those bursaries are offered to families who earn £100,000 a year plus. And they're mostly linked to academically selective tests. So they're not, you're not going to be, you know perfectly well, you're not going to be taking in the most disadvantaged primary school pupils. You're going to be taking in the pupils who, who have come coached or have kept up through primary school to pass the selective test. And the question I always ask private school heads is how many children in your schools do you have who are eligible for the pupil premium? Or how many are there across the, the independent sector? Answer comes there, none. Because they don't count them because there aren't any. And frankly, if these schools were doing so much to address disadvantage, they should be able to answer that question. Don't you think? Uh, I'm sure. Well, you know, uh, I think uh, the figures I've been, the figures I've, I've got are that 40,000 children benefit from bursaries and scholarships. But so they're families who earn up, they can earn upwards of 40, 50, 60,000 pounds a year. But nonetheless, they're making school fees affordable for those who currently can't afford it because they're not particularly well off. It's a myth to think that only the super rich can afford private education. But why is making school fees affordable for a tiny proportion of people? Why would that be a priority when we're talking about levelling up? What we should be worried about is what's happening to those millions of children who are, who are not funded well enough to get the chances in life that they need. And if this policy can even throw half a million pounds back into the state sector, frankly, it's a good thing in my view. Can I suggest, can I suggest a, a middle ground here? Instead of scrapping charitable status altogether, um, can we say that the sh- threshold you have to meet to, to get charitable status, the stuff you have to contribute back to the community back to your local state schools has to be much, much higher. You know, Toby, I hear what you're saying about these statistics, but I think we all know private schools that do the bare minimum in order to kind of meet some kind of charitable responsibility. You know, private schools who let the local state school use their swimming pool for two hours a a week or something like that. You know, that's just not enough, you know, even if you count the bursaries. Why don't we say raise the threshold? If you can meet the threshold where you're really helping local state schools, then you can keep that charitable status. And if you can't, then you don't. Do you think that would work, Toby? I've I've got no objection to making the um, burdens on governors of independent schools even higher to retain their tax benefits. Um, But I just can't see um, how you can believe that uh, charging VAT on school fees 
and charging full business rates on school buildings is actually going to bring in money, given that the number of children that'll have to uh, move out of that sector and be educated in the state sector as a consequence. Even if there are empty places, you're still going to have to employ more teachers, Fiona. Yeah, well, the state will have to employ more teachers than they otherwise would if those children would continue to be educated in the private sector. No, private those, sector. those teachers are currently, currently being employed by the state sector because as pupils go, you won't need as many of them. So the budget is there now. But the point is, I think that is a very good idea. And so what, what about this for an idea? Why don't we say to the independent schools, if you want to keep your charitable status, you take in the pupils who are hardest to teach, most likely to be excluded, can't pass your academic selective tests, you know, live at the council flat that most of those parents are trying to get their children away from. Why do you take them in? And let's see what they say. I can tell you what they'll say. They won't want it because that's not what their parents are paying for. It's an interesting point, Fiona, which is that many pupil referral units, many special schools, schools for children with special educational needs are independent schools. They charge fees. Usually those fees are paid by the local authority, not in every case. When Labour says it's going to charge VAT on independent school fees and charge full business rates for school buildings in the private sector, does it mean those schools as well? And if not, how's it going to differentiate between some private schools, but not all private schools? I think we're going to have to leave it there because we are running out of time. But... Fiona and Toby, thanks very much. And I hope that Keir Starmer or someone in Labour is, is watching because maybe we've come out with a middle ground.